everybody. Welcome to Destination Unknown, episode four. I leave Wisconsin and now I find myself in Salt Lake City, Utah with the iconic Ken Sanders from Ken Sanders Antiquarian Books, who is a mainstay and an iconic figure in our business. I thank Ken for getting me in his direction and having him face to face with me. Ken, I know who I'm sorry. <laughs> Ken, I know who you are. Um, I want to make sure everybody who watches our episode knows who you are. So tell us a little bit about who you are in the book world. Um, I know people will also know you from um, Antiques Roadshow as well. Um, right. But tell us a little bit about who you are, and then we're going to get into talking about the love of books. Sure. Um, so I don't remember a time I didn't read. My mother, my late mother, swore that I was born reading a book. I suppose that more than likely an exaggeration. <laughs> uh, I devoured all the books in the elementary school, the ones I wanted to read. And out of necessity, I loved comic books as, as a kid in the 50s and early 60s. And to get more comic books, I would just wheel and deal with other kids. Just I wasn't really buying and selling so much. It's just, I want more comic books. I wasn't thinking about the selling. I was thinking about the acquiring. And at all these decades later, uh, I've never quit. I've just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. Uh, I worked for in another well-known bookseller in Salt Lake City, at one time the only ABA member, there are now four of us in Utah, uh, Sam Weller Books. Okay. <clears throat> As I like Zion's Bookstore. As I like to tell the story, Sam hired me five times and <laughs> fired me 10 times. I know the math doesn't work, but it's a true story. I, I, I do understand. <laughs> uh, I started my first bookshop in 75, my uh, old buddy, Steve Jones, had a Salt Lake's first hippie head shop, the Cosmic Airplane, okay. which is started in 1967. Mm -hmm. uh, by 75, another 60s radical had inherited some money, put 50K into it, and they wanted to hire me to be their bookstore manager. Steve has always dreamed of having his own bookshop. I, in essence, talked my way into a three-way partnership and in 1975, Cosmic Airplane Books and Records, uh, was I, I created it. By 81, I couldn't get along with my partners. I was pretty much forced out of the business. We had sold that year, we sold $1.4 million in gross sales. We still had the head shop and a gift store, record shop, and I created the bookshop. I sold my Book of, first Book of Mormon ever okay. back in those days for five thousand dollars, eighteen thirty, Palmyra, New York. Today I could get yeah. What is it now? Twenty times that, one hundred and twenty-five thousand. Yeah. Wow, wow. So I, I know you. I know you could look back and go, you know, five thousand was was still great money back then for a book. I mean that that's unbelievable money for a book back then. <laughs> Um, but that just goes to show you what has changed in the marketplace, uh, good and bad with the rise of the internet and eBay and Amazon. I mean, you've seen everything. So I guess my, my first question does want to bring you back in time to, to, uh, to that first bookstore record shop and head shop. What, what were, what were you selling the most of back then? Well, we were the, we had a new used and rare bookshop in addition okay. to the other departments. Mm -hmm. We were the only store in Utah that sold new age books, you know, metaphysics, uh, gay and lesbian literature. Uh, Sci-fi was considered exotic in those right. days, crying out loud. We're the only place you could get it. Um, we did a ton. Oh, my God. We sold... Uh, the little, the, you know, the little golden guides that come in mm -hmm. the 20 pound racks. Who knew there was a little golden guide to hallucinogenic mushrooms? Wow, yes. We must have sold hundreds of those. They're worth hundreds of dollars a piece. Now they were, I think, a dollar 99 cents retail. We, we went through them by the cases. We, we had a 
really strong, uh, you know, obviously Utah and the Mormons, Western Americana, you, you'd have to be some kind of stupid to be a bookseller in Utah and not sell right. Mormon books. They're worth the right ones are worth a lot of money. Were you, were you get? I mean, at that time, I mean, of course, America was in its own throes of uh, the hippie movement and the Vietnam War and America yep. was changing with ERA and the civil rights. Were you, were you, was, was the store getting some political backlash back then for being ahead of its time? Oh, oh yeah. And, and both ways of, uh, we would have uh, militant feminists come in the store with the uh, silent agitators taters stickers okay and they would slap them on photo and art books that showed uh female nudity nudity that sure it insults women right so but well, we got both sides <laughs> right and boy i mean times have changed easy cliche as that sounds times have changed it's sort of flipped the script now yeah it, it, what's go, going on with our libraries all of us booksellers should be natural allies of our libraries wherever yeah. we live, and they need our help. We, I go on the radio periodically and claim I am the unbanner of books. For every book, I thank the bigoted parents for banning the books because they provide me a reading list of books to order. Sure. In. The, uh, sadly, the list is getting longer and longer. I mean, it's now stretch. I mean, I know this is shocking to you as it is to me, but it's now stretched to Dr. Seuss. I, yeah, and, and actually, I, you know, I, I've done a, a friend of mine is quite a, he's a professor at a private college and really a good son, and he really does deep dives into his, these things. And one day, we spent a couple of hours, because I really felt like my childhood, Ox was gored when they started banning uh, Dr. Seuss. But the truth, like it always is, is more subtle, and it's more complex than just surface thoughts that dr seuss himself rewrote and redid some of his books as being offensive like the quote unquote china man with the long right pick, yes that sort of thing but it's it's a deeper dive and we, we don't have time to get into it but the truth is always so much more complex so so theodore geisel was what he was altering his books after publication as America was changing. Yes, he was during his lifetime. And they've done it big time. Now, right. do I usually agree with it all or not? Maybe not. But it, it's not random censorship. It's very deep, culturally sensitive issues. Right. I mean, it has to do with things like, you know, we, we call peoples of the Arctic Circle Inuits these days. Sure. We don't, we've retired the term, um, you know, Inuit, like we've retired right. the term red man for a racist mm -hmm. derogatory term for native peoples and so on and so forth as, as we should. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Time, times have definitely changed. So it's interesting for me to think back of, of you growing up and heading this bookstore and um, fe ultra feminists were coming in and putting stickers over the the nude pictures of, of say a Richard Avedon book or something. Exactly. Um, and so going in, going into the eighties, which was a completely different time uh, in America, what changes did you see as, as, as you, you were evolving as a bookseller? Because you, you are living most people's dreams who love books. Everybody says they want to own a bookstore. As you said in other interviews, it's that smell, um, and that encompasses your life and my life. But what, what did you see as, as evolving from the 60s to the 70s? And now you're a different bookseller going into the 80s. Well, it, yeah, I mean, decades have changed. They all bring their, 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 their own generational issues. And, you know, I was still sort of young right then. In, in, in the uh, 1975, the late author Edward Abbey, First, mm -hmm. he published his classic Desert Solitaire in 1968, and he followed it up in 1975 with a novel called The Monkey Wrench Gang. Right. 1985, I, I became pretty good friends with Ed, and I, he let me publish a Robert Crumb illustrated edition of Monkey Wrench Gang in 85. And that <laughs> book in 75, when it was first published, inspired the real life uh, 
environmental group called Earth First with the exclamation right. point. They were, in fact, Edward Abbey introduced me to Earth First accidentally. I didn't know it. I met him March 24th, 1981 uh, at uh, uh, the uh, Glen Canyon Dam uh, in Arizona, Utah, Page, Arizona, where the next morning we dropped a 300 foot long plastic crack down the face of that dam to call attention to right. how uh, Lake Powell was destroying the Colorado River and Glen Canyon and the whole ecosystems down there. So it was just, it, it's a wild trip every night. I got heavily involved with Dave Foreman and the Earth Firsters up until about 1985. Yeah, the the 80s were very heavy with with the green movement, of course. You know, Earth First and Greenpeace as well. Greenpeace, yeah. Earth, Earth First, the Southern Utah Wilderness Society, are uh, out here. Sierra and Club, of, sure. A lot of Sierra Club, yeah. Nature Conservancy, Grand Canyon Trust. There, there were a lot of good good meaning people, but Reagan. Or, I'm sorry, the 80s were the Reagan years. Right. Uh, the Mountain States Legal Foundation, as a direct payoff for all the money they gave Reagan to have and help getting mm -hmm. elected, they got three cabinet posts. They got James Watt as the Secretary of the Interior, uh, Annie Gorsuch as the head of the APA, and Bob Burford as the head of the BLM. Gorsuch and Burford got married. And there's <laughs> now a Supreme Court justice named Gorsuch yeah. um, ama the amazing of yeah. the United States amazing <laughs> and, and all of this all of this stems from from you know Reagan coming into office from governor of California to president of the United States yep and and, and history shadows everything we do so we, what, yeah at, we, at just, what, we my bookstore is any good bookstore right. we have always tried to fight these fights. We, what, what, you know, when, when the during the Bush years, we have a almost fifty year old, fifty year Salt Lake Tribune cartoonist that always comes up as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, Pat Bagley, and mm -hmm. he came out with three, the funniest books you could ever read during the Bush years, called Clueless George Goes to War, <laughs> and my God, they're funny. And and then and then his son and then his son did the same thing. Yeah, his son did the same thing years later. We're we're always fighting. Yeah. We're always fighting. So what 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 you know after you left um, after you left the triage of the bookstore, what at what point did you start say to yourself, hey, it's time for me to start my own vision, have my dream come true, and own my own. Well, I want I want to tell one more cosmic story Please. first. Um, in the 1970s, even though the word didn't exist then, pedigree comic book collections started okay. coming out. Probably one of the most famous in the world is Chuck Rosansky's Mile High collection. Mm -hmm. It was by far the biggest. Then there was the San Francisco collection that my old buddy Bud Plant was one of the people in that. And the other big one of the 70s was the Cosmic Aeroplane Collection that I discovered and bought. We don't have time to get into it. I'm trying to write up the real story of it because it's complicated. And, and especially, I hadn't realized because of all the social media now, how there are hundreds of stupid, wrong, ignorant stories out there about the Cosmic Collection. Right. None of them are true. I've got the whole story now. And I'm trying to get it written down and at least published online so I can set the record straight. We, we didn't know the term pedigree collection right. then. And now, of course, comic books compared to them. Holy moly, big business, million it's, dollar books. Yeah, it, 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 it was dead for many, many years. And then it came from out of nowhere. And and now now they're putting comic books in in plastic and sealing them with with graded numbers they've just started this year they're slabbing pulp magazines what would robert crumb say about that <laughs> nothing you could print <laughs> is robert, that what you're really did you, you had a relationship with robert crumb oh, from, sure. from awesome. edward abbey well particularly through uh doing the artwork for 
the monkey wrench guy. I had a right. we hosted a series of autograph parties in, in 1985 for Ed and Robert uh, mm -hmm. in Utah, and also on a chain out in California called the Nature Company, defunct now. Got some great photographs of Abby and Crumb at Arches National Park back then. That's phenomenal. Uh, that was so, so in the eighties, I was I had started my publishing company, Dream Garden Press, in nineteen eighty. I published a book on Lost Roads Gold Mines. It's kind of hard to know what to call it. This <laughs> fantasy gold mine myth that just won't go away mm -hmm. out here. Anyhow, then I saw so I was into publishing big time. Uh, I ended up going through about a decade of really, really insane poverty. My marriage blew up. I lost my house. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ. I could depress the hell out of you going into all those stories, but it would depress me. So I was kind of hunkered down in a building my family owned, South Salt Lake. My late friend, the author Charles Bowden, used to write, yeah, I got this friend in Salt Lake, Ken Sanders. He says he's a bookseller. But if you go to his alleged bookstore, the doors are locked. And even if you knock, he won't let you in. <laughs> Chuck Bowden, an extraordinary writer, if you don't know him. Really, really tough to read because he wrote about the cracks in the sidewalk. He right. wrote about things we don't want to know. And his books from... Uh, Desierto, uh, Red Line, Down by the River, got into the whole Mexican drug killings and the slaughtering and raping of all the women in Juarez. Mm -hmm. Just, but he is such, had a, such a brilliant, fast mind. And man, that he could write. Blood Orchid is probably, I think, his best book of his 20 or so books he wrote. He and Ed, Ed Abbey were good friends in Tucson. Would you, I mean, f with your publishing house, would you consider yourself more of a muckraker? You were trying to expose the the, the uh, deficits of society through the, through the literature? No. My first book, it was strictly money. The okay. world's money. I can sell this, man. <laughs> and I published- A thousand it. copies a year. <laughs> I, we've done quite well with it yeah. over the years. Um. Monkey Wrench Gang's 25th anniversary, or no, 50th anniversary is next year. Anything and specially planned for that? Year. And in 2027 will be the centenary of Edward Abbey's birth. Is so there, are there any special plans for? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a special edition of Monkey Ranch Gang. I, I got to take the time to work on it before. Yeah. It gets too far ahead of me. Is is that going to be the original printing or the one with with Robert Crumb's? Uh, oh, it, 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 it'll it'll it, it's going to have Crumb. I'm hoping to get him hand colored this time. Um, yeah. But but so I did no. I mean, I did some books. I have no idea why I did them. <laughs> uh, I did a book on right after right when Chernobyl was in the news. Okay. On surviving nuclear armageddon mm. of the reluctant survivor okay. i can't begin to, why did I, I have no i don't know why i did it uh i did i did the very first book on mountain bikes in the 80s which i've come to have a real passionate dislike for shall we say because <laughs> oh we don't have motors we can go anywhere we want and do anything we, <laughs> no you can't <laughs> And the other books, I've, I've done some popular Utah history books uh, and some fun stuff. I did, we did a book we really had fun with in the 80s called Utah Gateway to Nevada. <laughs> we, God, we had a lot of fun, way too much fun with that book. My, my buddy Trent Harris is a filmmaker, cult filmmaker. He's made Plan 10 from Outer Space, the Beaver Trilogy, um, uh, 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 oh, the I'll, I'll forget it now. Anyhow, published one of his books called Mondo, Utah. And just and I've published several poetry books that I'm quite proud of. They don't sell worth crap, of course. Your own um, your own poetry? Oh no, God no. I would never subject that on anyone. <laughs> Although I, I wrote two poems during the pandemic that I'm pretty proud of. Uh, I published two song books, one by Utah Phillips, who was a pretty famous folk singer around these parts. Uh, 
and also by a dear friend of mine, uh, a woman named singer songwriter named Kate McLeod, done okay. a, a songbook of her 52 of her songs. She writes extraordinary stuff. She's been uh, playing the violin since she was six years old. Uh, I'm just stuff that I wanted to stuff that meant something to me, knowing look, the thousand copies I print, I'll be lucky to sell them. I'm never going to make money off it. Um, so how so, fertile how fertile is the publishing for you nowadays? Or is it something oh, you're still oh, active at? No, it's almost extinct. Yeah. Almost extinct. Is it for something 10, you would like to bring back? Yeah, but I don't, the money and the time and I, I don't have a staff. Right. God knows I can't do all those processes myself if I ever could. Right. Editing, maybe. I, for 10 years of my life, I started with the Edward Abbey uh, Western Wilderness Calendar. Okay. And after the first year, I started using multiple authors and I did it for 10 years. I built up this empire. I, I was publishing count, national park and wilderness calendars in cooperation with the parks from Yellowstone, Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, the Great Smokies, uh, the Pacific Northwest, the Southwest, um, uh, Big Ben National Park in Texas, the giant lion. They had way too long of a story to tell, and it ends badly. And uh, let me say one thing. I've never had a lot of money. Money is not a god to me. I don't care about money. It, it's, I've learned painfully. It's easier to get along if you have some of it than not. Right. But it's, just, it's not a god that I worship. And I, maybe I should have paid more attention to it. But during those calendar years, I was publishing... 17 different wilderness park calendars every single year and i would and i it, it just got too big it, it yeah. failed spectacularly um the person that stole my calendar company from me 10 years of my creative life sold it for five million dollars do you want to guess how much of that I got? I'm going to guess that it was a round number. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Nada. But you kind of you have to let stuff like that go or it's just going to poison and ruin you. So, so now, now I mean, I, this, I, I don't know how to count how long I've been in this business. If you go by Cosmic Airplane, it would be 75. Right. So. That's almost 50. That's almost, that'll be 50 years next year. But I was, I ran a mail order business in high school. Uh, I ran rub off lettering ads and things like uh, Herbdom and Rocket Spass Comic Collector and fanzines of the day. I sold underground comic books. I was, I was only 16 and my ads would say, you must be 18 or over to buy <laughs> these comics. Well, hell, I was selling them. Not buying well, them. Let, let, let's talk about that. That's a very interesting avenue. Um, you you were you grew up in Utah. Oh yeah, born and raised. So so I with those underground comics, so so many of them were being published in uh, San Francisco. Yep. You must have had a connection of some sort, wholesaler or some retailer where you'd be able to get them. Yeah. Well, a, a, a good friend of mine I'd known in the mid '60s. Uh, he was kind of older than me, kind of a 50s greaser type mm -hmm. car guy. He was a comic book geek. He moved to San Jose, California, okay. right into the comic book. And every year he'd come back with a suitcase for him and blow our freaking minds out. So I soon became friends with uh, uh, Baba Ron Turner at Last Gas Press and um, the print mint people and other people and just started importing them direct and they were so new i mean years later especially zap four sure. people were going to jail for obscenity for them mm -hmm. but i was ahead of the curve so to speak nobody knew what the hell they were so, <laughs> so were you, were you, were, did you ever travel into california to get them or were they oh, yeah. always, they, they... Oh, every year i was from the late 60s on i was doing fantasy and science fiction conventions uh throughout southern and northern california I participated as an exhibitor 
at the world's first underground comic book convention in Berkeley in 1973. Von Bode was there doing his weird theater cartoon cavalcade mm -hmm. with all, not many teeth, you know. Do you still have any pamphlets or ephemera from that, from that convention? I have the program. Yeah, that's phenomenal. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> So Memories. much of so much of that stuff just went by the wayside. Nobody thought about collecting anything back then. Well, there, there was a consciousness that started sometime between the late sixties to early seventies. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, you know, I just consider it, it's manufactured reality. You know, these fake limited editions and alternate covers, and boy, it le leaves me pretty cold. Well, you know, when they call it a limited edition, there ain't nothing limited about it. <laughs> no. <laughs> you uh, and I, Caxton, you and I know that. Yes, Caxton Press, a small, not the famous William Caxton. Caxton Press, Idaho. They, the publisher of Vardis Fisher, very obscure novelist, but he was today. He was Thomas Wolfe's roommate. Okay. Um, and he wrote brilliant, beautiful novels, and one of the one of the greatest. And he destroyed his reputation, but he was a, quite a feuder and fighter but Caxon Press did some uh, there's one of the Vidrar Hunter tetralogy and I, I don't know like uh, we are betrayed uh, passion spin the plot uh, in tragic life they did limited Morocco signed copies mm -hmm. that in tragic life the print run was 26 26 copies i have been looking for one for more than 50 years never found it where That's do you where, where do you think they ended up a written initially i mean who bought them probably a handful of his fans and western libraries maybe right. i haven't ever done actually i should do a world cat or a oclc search to see where they are i'm sure there's some out there now and, but I mean, I would have to think that one of them has come up for auction somewhere along the line. I bet not because he's too obscure. Nobody would have, they would have put in a little <laughs> no, Nobody would take the time to try and peddle a single Vargas Fisher book. <laughs> Only you. <laughs> but, but he, his last novel, he wrote it in the 60s. And man, he still had it. It was called Mountain Man. Mm -hmm. And it was the basis of the Robert Redford movie Jeremiah Johnson. Okay. So were, were they were they western were they western novels? He was a western historian yeah, okay. novelist. Sure, okay. But he tried he did this Testament of Man series 11 volumes destroyed his literary reputation. Basically tried to reinvent the entire Christian mythos in 11 mm -hmm. volumes. Nobody liked that. Now is is that can you still find those editions? Yeah. Yeah, you, you can find them, you can't sell them. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think there's a buyer for almost every every book out there. I, I sometimes feel it's amazing. Yeah, yeah the yeah. market amazes me. I so, sold a lot of artist fishers. So how do you feel? How do you feel now about the book market nowadays? I mean, you have eBay dominating and Amazon dominating. Are you familiar with the platform whatnot? I've heard of it as all. Mm -hmm. I've been on eBay, though we don't really do anything with it since 97. Okay. Um, I did, was on Amazon very, very early. Now I absolutely, except uh, what I, here, here's what I've learned about Amazon. Even if you're trying to avoid them, you can't. <laughs> I would go through, I would go to my grandchildren's wish lists on right. Amazon. Yeah. I would dutifully write down what they wanted. I would source it elsewhere and buy it. Then I would have to go back to Amazon to take it off their wish list so somebody else didn't buy it for them. It was a lot of work, pain in the ass. One day, I got three packages in the mail. I had ordered them from three, I thought, <laughs> independent places. They all came from Amazon. Yeah. They, they've changed the marketplace. Uh, yeah. I, I don't care for Jeff Bezos. I don't. I think the world right now is being run 
by a handful of batshit crazy billionaires. And, you know, we say this every gen generation, we're going to hell in a handbasket. What's weird about these crazy years, pandemic back to the orange haired monster, everyone, regardless of your political view or how left or right you perceive yourself to be, we're parroting one another. We all think the exact same thing, but right. we have a different boogeyman. But we all agree that our, our world that we have known is going to hell. Yeah, you, you just said it easy. earlier. You said we're all going to hell in a handbasket and all those people are going, they're trying to race to the moon for some reason. I, I think I think I think the writing's on the wall. <laughs> I would I advocate the moon program. I but I want it to be one way. <laughs> and I would even donate money to I don't think you know Elon Musk and Jeff Bozo Bozo <laughs> so I like to call him. <laughs> I know it's childish to give people silly nicknames, but I love it. Well, you know, um, it it's changed the book market though. Yeah, and not for the good. The, the a Amazon horseshit, they make eaters, and uh, their perception of the book, where it's just, it's harmful. When they're, they're changing your listings, how you, what you write up about the books, even a book, which of course we all know Amazon owns, right. my, my unique identifier number, we use the FileMaker Pro Bookhound program, mm -hmm. those numbers aren't on my listings anymore online. I, right. They've gotten rid of them. Where did they go? Why? Well, do, do, do you think, though, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, if you were looking for a rare book, hopefully you would be, hopefully you'd be part of uh, some sort of mailing where you would get a catalog in from a, from a antiquarian bookseller and you would peruse that 34 page catalog to see if the book that you desired was in that catalog. Or and get on the phone. Yeah. Now, now AB it's Bookman's, a, AB yeah. Bookman's Weekly, especially those of us out oh, here in the gosh. West, We could, I heard stories of people uh, that would go to the post office in New Jersey where they mailed it from mm -hmm. and have a post office box there. Just so, so they could, yeah. Just so they could be the first person <laughs> right. to do it. And all, by the time I called from Utah, I almost never got anything because we didn't get them till a Thursday or even a Friday. And all the good stuff was gone by then. But, but <laughs> looking back, looking back at those catalogs, Ken, it, it was just black words on white paper, page after page after page after page. No now, images. Wonder, yeah, no wonder our eyes are destroyed. <laughs> yeah, there's that. It, yeah. It, it was a different, I, I don't mean, you know, it, it, it's easy to get into this nostalgia, you know, hey, you kids, get off my grass. But, because you know, I'm old and crotchety now. But it wasn't just Halicon days. There was fraud and forgery then. Mm -hmm. it, oh, sure. It's worse now because it's so more, more right. easy and accessible to do all these bad things. But you could wait months or a year and couldn't find somebody wanted to pay a big hundred bucks for a rare book. Right. You couldn't find it for them. Right. Now... Now we think now you can find almost anything. You know that it's at our fingertips on our computer. I I think though, in some ways, this has been healthy for the book for the book world, because the, the books are now getting into people's hands. Yes, well, I love that part. Of course, we all yeah. do. But and books, except for the truly rare, they're not rare. No. Rare, rare. I know I saw an interview where, where someone asked you about rare books and you made me laugh. You said a rare book is a book that I have and you don't. <laughs> yeah, smart ass me. My other line, my favorite other line is, is uh, likes to lecture people. Every book, whether it deserved it or not, has a first edition. <laughs> and some of those were in magazine form, as you and I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I was just reading a the introduction. I, I'm, I've been moving my reference library, which is pretty large, and we and finding a lot of duplicates. I can't get much out of them, but I can sell them. So I was reading the introductions to a, a 20 year old published uh, guide to the armed forces editions. You know, mm -hmm. the little paper, the little funny shaped paperbacks for 
GIs in World War II. And, you know, there was millions of them produced. And some of them, boy, you cannot find them to this day. Well, I'll tell you a quick funny story. The first book that I ever sold online, you'll appreciate this. The first book that I ever sold online was a kit book for soldiers. And it had an it had an uncollected J.D. Salinger story in it from, I believe, 43. Sweet. Yeah. And so that's what sort of got me hooked on on learning how to sell books um, online. But, um, you know, it's it's interesting with everything that's going on in the world. And as you say, you know, going to hell in the handbasket, where where do you envision book culture changing in the next decade? Well, I mean, you know, five, 10 years ago, there's all this, the book is dead, book is dead. Monster. Oh gosh, yes, yeah. Yeah, no real book people ever believe that. <laughs> we, we have always lived in a far distant corner of the universe. We're not normal, we're <laughs> not mainstream, and we never will be. <laughs> Ergo, we will never die, we'll never right. go. Yes, we die out. You and I are gonna die mm-hmm. out soon. But I am seeing... And going back some years now, younger booksellers getting into the trade. And some of us, ABAA, IOVA, others are making a big push to include diversity, getting people of color, getting more women. And there's always been great women in in the book trade. But I am seeing more women than ever. I'm seeing more young people than ever. Uh, You know, I only do, you know, some ABA fairs and regional mm-hmm. Western fairs, there are more, and they're not just buying 10, $20 books. Maybe they're right. not buying multi-thousand dollar ones yet. Who, who among us was at the height of our buying powers in our twenties? Yeah. But maybe that's more common today. Right. <laughs> well, I think, I think this will make you happy. I, I run a Patreon group called paper gold an ongoing book hunters conversation. Mm-hmm. And we, we have just about 100 members in that group. All of them are online booksellers across the world, um, as far as Australia and England and Tel Aviv. Um, and we meet every Thursday at eight o'clock on Zoom. Fun. And we talk and you, this will make you happy. We talk about selling books and sourcing books and and how to get better at the profession and the art of selling books. Uh, the, the young people in the trade, they have to be smarter. They have to think quicker. They have to invent new ways of right. selling. Them. The sharpest collectors and dealers and librarians have always known if we do collection development in this weird, yeah. weird space that only we can see, man, is that going to pay off big time. Right. I think we're getting it. We've got new collector things. You know, a lot of groups are, uh, uh, including ABAA, are sponsoring these new collector prize groups where a teenager can win a thousand dollar prize. I don't know what is it, 14, 16 year old, thousand. I mean, when I, in 1965, when I was 14 years old, grandparents took us Southern California, Norwalk. We had a great aunt and uncle. We went to Knott's Berry Farm. We went deep sea fishing. And I mm-hmm. begged, pop my grandfather to take me to bertrand smith's acres of books 240 long Coach, okay. california uh i have no idea to this day i how did i know about this right i go in there it had to be the old man bertrand smith himself it was endless room after room giant skylights the back rooms had no electricity if it was a cloudy day of course southern california that doesn't happen <laughs> uh, you had needed a flashlight to even browse the titles he unlocked the door to this rare book room and i bought a giant alice in wonderland uh, coloring book mm. i bought a beautiful 20s illustrated alice by gwyneth hudson a welsh woman who only ever illustrated two books alice and peter pan about okay. a Maxwell parish arabian nights and i bought the folio uh, Raven by Poe with the Gustav Doré. Doré, Gustav Doré, yes. I paid $17.50 for that book. I've sold two of them in the past year. That My copies, 
my my own personal copy is i don't have that one right. sad. that's another story i have a nice copy they're they're never nice i've sold two nice ones in the past year at three thousand and thirty five hundred dollars that's the that's the gustav Doré. yeah 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 you know, in, in 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 my world of online book selling, he still he still sells very well. They all, everybody wants the Bibles that that he illustrated. Dante know. Milton. Yeah, yeah, uh, and you, uh, you, you you can still find you can still find those books in the out in the wild. They're 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 out mm -hmm. there at the estate sales. If you know what you're looking for, you can still find them. A lot of families had them, and, yeah. and they were. I mean, Gustave Dore. From 1860 to 90, 90s, he was one of the best-selling illustrators in the world. There were over 300 titles in print. There's that's, a lot of yeah, that's that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing that's an amazing number, and and yeah. and yet and yet he's still powerful today. He still sells yeah. every, he's still, he still sells every day. So, but, but but I tell that story because. We all have those stories of our mm -hmm. childhood things that imprint, and uh, I, particularly the the Hudson Alice and the right. uh, Odore Raven. I buy every single copy of those books I can find, and I have I never have one for very long because my natural enthusiasm sells the books to other to others. And so you 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 know not only were you a voracious book reader as a child, but you you also developed the instinct of collecting, I guess, as a child too. Well, I'm, I'm talking. I was 14 years old. Yeah, I was I was a serious book collector yeah. by. 14. Well, I know you weren't. I know you weren't coloring in that coloring book. I know that. I know. I I know. Mm -hmm. I know you understood the value of not coloring that in. <laughs> Us, I would have colored outside the lines. <laughs> I would have been terrible. As all it. great booksellers do. <laughs> <laughs> so so let, let me get back to, you know, where you see, you know, because you've been around for so long in the book world, do you see it turning into a positive light in the next decade? You mentioned more booksellers, more females. Um, with, with the rise of the internet, is this a positive light for books or is this a negative light? Well, it's simultaneous. You know, it's the best of times, the worst of times. Okay. It, the potential is there. Like I say, the younger people getting creative, how you market on social media, how you learn who your contemporaries right. in the trade and the library trade are, how you have to learn a language and a mythology of selling to them by pitching, not wasting their time, pitching to them what right. they want. Yeah, and <laughs> there's all these tools and techniques. My young people are doing it to an extent, but because of my age and my extreme dislike of, I mean, I'm I'm a hopeless Ned Luddist, that's for sure. And I, we could be doing a lot more with that, but I'm 72. It's unlikely that we will. I've had some paths for some reason. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done appraisals, I think you mentioned early, for Antiques Roadshow for yes. almost 20 years now. And that, that's not a future I ever foresaw for myself. Right. It isn't a job. It doesn't, it's not a job because you're a volunteer. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks we get paid. That's not true. Um, but it's not a job you can apply for. They have to pick you. Right. And clearly, they, they got me on a board 20 years ago because I could do Mormon books for them. They don't keep me around to do Mormon books, but they've kept me around all these years. And then, you know, just other associations in my life. I was the security chair for the ABAA for uh, six years. Okay. And I started chasing book thieves through, yeah. through <laughs> cyberspace, which is hilarious because I'm a Luddite and John Charles Gilkey I figured out all online never met the man figured out what he was doing how he was doing it and set him up and put him in San Quentin for three years took me three years of my life to do that 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 soulful work that that sort of reminds me of uh the book by Nicholas Basbane's Gentle Madness oh and that's Nick Nick's yeah. one of the great ones in our trade what a what a great book that is. 
yes, it's my favorite. I, next yeah. books are all good, but yeah. that first one is dear to my heart. Yeah, I, I remember when that came out and I read that. I almost read that cover to cover in about <laughs> one sitting. <laughs> yeah, so a journalist named Allison Bartlett wrote a book book about me and my book thief called The Man mm -hmm. Who Book Too Much. So I, yeah. so I get all this notoriety off that. And then I get out because being here in Utah, a Mormon bookseller, and hey, what about that Mark Hoffman guy, the Mormon, Mormon bomber, forger, murderer? Um, I only ever met him once in my life, but I, being from Utah, I'm, anytime I'm in the book world, I'm going to get asked about that. Yes. So let me, let me ask you about the physical store. Um, sure. I, I, you know, I know you're probably a voracious buyer as well. You have a lot of books coming in. Does that, does everything go to the website or is only a partial number of books going to the website? Okay. I, I turned over a new leaf. Uh Oh, I'm not buying books anymore. I mean, that's not ever going to be true, <laughs> but giant collections, warehouses, houses uh -huh. full. I'm done. I can't do it anymore. Is it because you just get too much backlog? There are right now, it, our, we moved from our old store. Mm -hmm. Our sales have been in the toilet for six years because of the construction around us, just killing us, killing us, killing okay. us. And, and we're getting torn down now. I've got to go in tomorrow morning. We have maybe hopefully five carloads of shit left to get out. Right. We started moving three years ago from the we old started, from the old store to yeah, the new yeah okay we, yeah we started moving in earnest we closed down the old shop and opened in the new shop six last september six right. months yeah i've been following that on instagram yeah so so yeah. and i don't see any of that i have no idea what what they've said about it you, you're looking see. good you're looking good <laughs> so our 1600 square foot main foot store that's kind of together with the it's in a museum called the leonardo it's an old library yes. i was a kid so that's 1600 square feet used books but mostly new books and we try to support their you know science-based mm -hmm. clientele so we got if they're called the leonardo right. so we've got a whole section of leonardo books we've got science books space books all that jazz kids books big time but um, do, you, do you have a rare book room that those clients can go into? We have stores on three, the three lower floors. Okay. You have to go around a corner, down a stairs, or an elevator to a thousand square foot rare book room. <laughs> a labyrinth. <laughs> then in the sub-basement, I've renamed it Ken Sanders Rare Books. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that word sub basement. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Twenty five hundred square feet retail. Wow. In there. That's a that's a, that's a nice size bookstore. <laughs> when we call the cage, yeah, two thousand square feet that has a backlog of some fifteen hundred banker boxes of books, and we've been as we've been lugging the stuff out. Travis, my other employee, has been oh my god, oh my god. We, we just keep finding really great stuff yeah. so there's a light at the end of the tunnel if we can just get to the tunnel how, so how many employees do you have working at the store there's six three three full-time three part-time and you know the i want to get out of the day, day of the store i would love to use this as an infomercial if you don't mind no i would love to find someone to come in and buy the i i've spent all my life i don't want it to die with me i've got a five and a five-year lease renewal at a very favorable rate at this space in the leonardo museum we're still figuring out how to make that work mm -hmm. i want somebody to come in and you know i'm paying some money out of it but not a lot i need somebody to take it over the day-to-day -day. i would stay around and do whatever a new owner wanted to as little as much as they wanted me to um I got to get out of the day to day this because right. the stress of it is killing me yeah. and it's making me a very unhappy person. It, it is a and, lot of work. Even, even, I, even working from home is a lot of work in the book trade. Yeah. I don't want to do it anymore. And it's not, that I have bad employees. They, they, they work for me in ways that I don't even know. And I probably, you know, don't appreciate enough. Um, 
the move has been very stressful on it. But I think the store could have a beautiful future. And, and we've really got the inventory. So yeah. back, you, you actually asked a question. I would say there's easily over 100,000 books in the shop, and there are only 10,000 of them cataloged online. Right. Now, there's way more out on the shelf. Mm-hmm. We're not going to, for the most part, we don't catalog 10, $20 books. Right. But now, along with those 10,000 online, does that mean that Ken Sanders books also ships books every day around the world yes we do yeah yeah not enough i keep i keep thinking we should you know i I want about a grand a day online sales and there are days when we do that much Mm -hmm. Um, a thousand a day isn't enough for me i can't i can't cover the expenses right i used to be a million covid and, and these last six dark years we've gone through with the construction my sales are down 2023 down to where if we don't turn it around right uh, we're not going to make it i would you, I, I you don't you don't think that part of the solution to that dilemma is online sales though oh absolutely yeah but i we're trying we have to it's yeah. the mandate get more books online fine yeah that yeah the more you list of good books the more you're going to sell good books yeah it's true no I, i'm a believer it's yeah. just getting to that stage and we are we are finding really f- fabulous stuff i've i've got this artist archive of he corresponded with everyone you could imagine now the the low-hanging fruit of kind of sold off like he had a 36 letter correspondence with paul bowles <laughs> that was easy to sell yeah, I, I think you can make one or two phone calls and get that sold. Yeah. yeah but uh, some of it is is a little harder. There's two wonderful postcards uh, from the 80s from Stephen King to this artist. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is it. My wife says no more. My living room is looking like a FedEx office. <laughs> uh, I'm not signing. This is the last box right. of I'm signing for you. No more. That's it. Yeah. Well, so that's pretty good provenance, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, I've I sold think, all the books. I, I think there's yeah, there's money to be made there for sure. <laughs> well, that brings that almost brings us to our hour. I don't ever want to take more of your valuable time. As always, it, it, it's just been a true honor to speak with you and and pick your brain, and and the history of you as a bookseller. My audience is going to love love everything you've had to say. Um, you know, the show is called Destination Unknown. So you know what the last question of my day is with you is where are you gonna where are you gonna send me? <laughs> well, to a destination unknown, duh, Max. Come on. <laughs> um, first, thank you. Uh, it, it it's always fun to talk to fellow booksellers we don't make enough time for it we kind of see each other's a lot when we do book yes. fairs uh, but you know the cyberspace is a pretty lonely space and for other reasons, i said i just think there's so much going on in the trade today mm-hmm. that gives me more and despite a lot of the doom and gloom i portrayed right. that it's really encouraging so it, it is. the name i'm going to give you uh, I think her, her, of her as being in the trade since yesterday. I know that's not true. It's probably been, I don't know, my time sense is gone. Ten years ago, some wayward bookseller was traveling across the country to take a position running a California bookseller. Well, she's out on her own, and she didn't have any money and no place to stay. Okay. So my buddy Kent Shantz, that worked for me at the time, he's out on his own now with Shantz Rare Books. And uh, right now, Utah has four ABAA members. That's a that's big time for a little punk. You state. were the only one at one time. You were it. Sam Weller was the first and only one. Okay. I was number two. Okay. <laughs> so so she came, Kent, and his wife took her out to dinner mm-hmm. and I put her up for the night because I have a whole floor, guest floor of the house here. And uh, her name is Kate Midas. She is now a very successful. ABAA member from Oakland, California, and she's smart and knows her stuff and has really jumped into selling archives and non-book material, as many of our uh, colleagues have done, Max, as you know, and 
she's really, really bright and smart. And I, I, I think she's really worthy of being known more. Thank you. She's the epitome of what I'm talking about when I talk about these new young booksellers. Excellent. So you will reach out to her, let her know I'm going to yeah. contact her. And mm -hmm. she will be she will be episode five of Destination okay. Unknown. Again, it was an honor to have a conversation with you about the things we both love. And um, I hope to physically see you at your store sooner or later and uh, and buy a copy of a book from you. Max, a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Adios.